Well, Happy New Year to all our listeners, Pete. So let's start with Mercury, the innermost planet. Um, this is around, so it sets 70 minutes after the sun by the end of the month. That isn't too bad, is it, for Mercury? No, it's an evening object, um, so uh, that's quite well placed, really. Um, they're not too bad at this time of year. And, of course, it's joined by the other really bright evening object, which is the planet Venus. And Venus is now quite something in it the evening is. sky. It is. It's really, really it's dazzling. Of course, that's not the best time to look at Venus through a telescope. The best time is to catch it in the dusk so that the uh, the brighter sky offsets well, the contrast the is, yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, but yes, it's a beautiful object uh, at the moment. It's going to continue to dominate our evening skies for a few more months yet. It sets really late, actually, doesn't it? About three, nearly four hours, actually, after the sun goes down. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's around for quite a while. Um, yeah, and, and, that, and that means it's seen against, I, I know what you're talking about, observing it, um, as the sky is starting to get darker, so it's not fully dark, but it is very impressive with the naked eye when you're not actually observing it with a telescope. Yes. When it sets so long after the sun because uh, it, you can see it against a dark sky, and that's quite impressive. It's quite dazzling, actually. Uh, I've, I've never actually seen shadows cast by Venus, but I believe it is possible. I have seen shadows cast by Venus, and I've photographed them as well. Was that, well, we tried it in La Palma, didn't we, that time? And, uh... We did. That failed miserably, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the, I mean, the way to do it is to, to make sure that you're in a location which has got no other light around it, obviously. You can just see Venus up in the sky. And then have a, um, a screen of some sort. That could be a white wall. Um, oh, I've, yeah. I've done it on a, a landing, which has got a, um, a west-facing window. So every light in the house is turned off. Venus is shining through the landing onto a wall. And I stick something onto the landing window, so mm. like a target of some sort, um, and that casts the shadow. Right. And what you do is you, you normally need to use quite a long exposure to actually capture the shadow because yeah. it's really, really faint. But to make sure that you have caught it, if you aim your camera at the wall and just keep taking exposure after exposure, you can animate them together and you can see the shadow move because Venus is setting. Oh, that's quite clever. Oh, that's, there we are, nice little project to do in the cold January months and February months whilst Venus is uh, well placed in the sky. Look forward to that. Yeah, moving further out, Mars, low down in Ophiuchus. Um, it's currently quite small with the telescope. It'll take a while for it to become good again, but we are going to have a very good Mars opposition this year and it's going to be very good for UK observers. Yeah, but it'll be good. Really quite looking forward to that. Quite small for now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, through a telescope. Actually, it's a good time to look at it through a telescope because it gives you something to compare it with when it gets really big. Yeah, and when it gets large, it is uh, impressive, quite an impressive yeah. sight. Uh, Jupiter, this is also a morning object. Uh, it's quite near the sun on the 1st of January and it rises about one hour, 15 minutes before sunrise by the end of the month. So slowly becoming a reasonable object. But of course, again, Jupiter is going to be low down for... It's this current apparition. Yeah, OK. Well, we've got Saturn as well. Saturn's quite close to Jupiter. Uh, it's actually in conjunction with the Sun on the 14th of January, so it's not visible this month. And that leaves us the two ice giants, um, which are actually reasonably well positioned. Uranus is very well positioned, um, but it does start to lose altitude as the sky darkens towards the end of the month. And Neptune, um, being a little further to the west, yes. is in an even worse position. It's, it's amazing how quickly they do... They of drop off. Drop down off the, 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 uh, <laughs> the viewing scale, unfortunately. So uh, plenty to look for in terms of the planets. And the moon as well. Um, the moon is our nearest neighbour in space, obviously, and there's lots of things that are of interest um, on the moon. And one which captures people's imagination quite often um, is what's called a Claire Obscure effect. So it's this a strange is, name, that Claire. It, well, it's it, it means it's basically trick of the light. Um, it's, it's shadow play, light and shadow. Um, so basically, what happens is you get various effects which occur. Um, normally quite close to the moon's terminator, the dividing line between night and day, where the shadows form shapes which are recognisable. And um, there is an effect, it's, this is, isn't actually shadow, it's actually the light hitting uh, various features close to the terminator that makes it look as if there are two giant letters oh, yes. on the moon, the X and the V. Now this will be visible on the 2nd of January, so if you have a telescope for Christmas, Great time to get out there, have a look at the moon, have a look at the, um, the Terminator, 
um, around about half past eight or so and see if you can see a letter X, which is about uh, two thirds down from the top of the moon, two thirds down from the north point, the X, and the V, which is about a third of the way down from the top. Um, see if you can spot those two letters. This is on the 2nd of January. This is so. on the 2nd of January. And then, of course, uh, you've got another, if you haven't got a telescope, um, on the, um, the 4th of January, uh, we've got the peak in the early hours of the quadranted meteor shower. And that should be okay, actually. There is a bright 57% waxing gibbous moon, um, which will spoil the early part of the display. But that sets about one o'clock in the morning. So that leaves the morning of the 4th perfect for quadranted viewing. Yes, uh, I've never had much luck with the quadranteds, actually. So uh, It's a very cold shower. It is a cold shower. I can shower. remember <laughs> observing that once in the, um, in the snow and um, yeah. it was on. It was on an old sunbed which had metal those those metal um, feet on it. And I, I remember with the colleagues I was observing with getting sl slowly further and further away from them. And it was because the the bottom of the rail was melting on the snow and the, and it was just drifting. Down. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's uh, it's a cold time to do it, but uh, hopefully people will see something. Uh, just a mild interest, uh, I suppose. So the fifth of January, um, the Earth is at perihelion. This is the closest point in its orbit to the Sun. So yeah, uh, it won't feel like it. I should no, imagine right. on the fifth of January, but <laughs> it's an interesting to note. Um, we do have a nice event on the tenth. So. Um, this is an interesting phenomenon. The evening's full moon will pass through the, the outer part of the Earth's shadow. So this is a penumbral lunar eclipse. Yeah. Um, these are difficult to see visually. I've had a go many times myself. But this is a good thing to do if you've got a camera. Um, you should be able to pick up the, the slight darkening uh, on the moon, slight coloration. It's, a, it's an interesting thing because um, it's the southern part of the moon which will get darker. That's that's where the lunar highlands are. So they're normally fairly bright. Yeah. Um, so they will get a little bit darker. But I can tell you that if you weren't aware it was happening, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even notice no. it. No, that's, yeah, I, I've, I've always struggled to see them. Um, on the 12th, though, something that is a lot more prominent, the uh, centre of the almost full moon is just 43 minute, arc minutes north of the M44 cluster, Prisapi, or Beehive cluster, uh, in Cancer the Crab. So that's, that's a nice thing. That's they often get these pairings with the moon and M44, actually. Yeah, you do. It's um, Yes, it's quite a, a common one to... Uh, to actually um, have that sort of conjunction. It's quite difficult because the, the stars are well hidden by the moon's very bright glow. Yeah. Well, as we go towards the end of the month, on the 27th, um, there is an interesting meeting between Venus and Neptune. Um, they'll just be uh, 4.3 arc minutes apart on the 27th. So that's actually a good one to look out for because you've got the brightest planet in the solar system <laughs> and, the, and the dimmest. <laughs> that's, and if you've never seen uh, Neptune before, this is a good way of finding it. You can use Venus, which can't possibly be mistaken in the evening sky, as a way of finding it. No, that's right. Well, what about the stars then? Let's go out uh, into the January night sky. And I suppose we have to deal with the most iconic yes. of all the constellations, really. Um, that's Orion the Hunter. And um, I suppose the, the bit which really stands out with Orion is the belt. Yes, it's quite obvious. Uh, there's this line of stars, three stars. But, although it, but that's really strange, episode. isn't it? It's just three stars. Yeah. Um, when they form this straight line, they're almost the same brightness, um, and they are equally spaced, which is Good going, really, I suppose, for three stars. Um, but it is very iconic. And I, that I've been with people, actually, um, who know the sky fairly well. And as it's darkening or the sky is partially obscured, they've seen three stars which are in a line. And they immediately say, oh, that's Orion, mm. and it, even if it isn't. But because that, those three stars are so recognisable, yes. you, you, it sort of triggers something in your head. So it's... That's a good way to start with Orion. You just go and look for those three stars together. And when you do that, of course, you're looking at a deep sky object. Yes, this is Colander 70, uh, the uh, open cluster. So quite a nice thing to do. Actually, if you take a pair of binoculars, um, you can see quite a few more stars. Or the finder of your telescope, actually. That's, That's... the best way to see Colander 70, because it's so big. It is so big, so spread out. Telescope doesn't do it justice. Um, I've seen some nice long exposure photographs of this area, and you do see some faint, wispy... 
Yes, nebulous there structure. is nebulous stuff there, yeah. Well, I suppose the most obvious nebula, which we have to, <laughs> have to deal with, um, is uh, the Orion Nebula. Yes, M42, and this is right in the centre of Orion's sword, so you can find it very easily just by looking below the belt uh, of Orion. I think it's even obvious with the naked eye that this is quite fuzzy. Now, that's an interesting thing to say because it's often said it's one of the few... Um, nebulae which are visible with the naked eye. You've got the Lagoon Nebula as well, which is quite bright. But I'm not sure you can see it with the naked eye. You see, I can tell it's fuzzy. Yes, but there's a lot of faint stars there. That's true, that's true. But it's even whether it's the faint stars or the nebulosity coursing, you can tell with the naked eye. Yes, you can. It's not a pinpoint prick of light like Rigel or Betelgeuse or any of the stars but I do. Belt. I do question whether you can actually see the nebula with the well, naked eye. Well, you're quite eye. wrong, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've never seen the Lagoon Nebula, though, because I'm uh, with the naked eye, but then I've never been that far south yet. So. OK, so the Lagoon is, is quite bright. Um, but M42 is beautiful, isn't it? It's just through binoculars or a telescope, you can definitely see it then. You can. What's interesting, actually, this is one of the very few deep sky objects, visually for me, that as you use telescopes, only slightly larger, much more becomes apparent. So, well, I remember when I first started using a four-inch telescope with the Orion, uh, the Orion Nebula, and you could see the trapezium and the stars inside. And then the six-inch shows quite more, but then the eight-inch telescope I got now, uh, and then the 12-inch, the, the amount of detail is really overwhelming. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, that's right. Every, every size of a aperture. A couple of inches uh, add on yeah. to the aperture, and it really does reveal it a does. lot more structure yeah. and a lot more of the little faint stars that you can see in it as well. well. The, you mentioned the trapezium. The trapezium is the cluster of stars which are formed out of the nebula material, and they're right in the centre of um, the nebula itself. And it's, it's very obvious. It's a good focus target, actually. If you're trying to focus your telescope yes. or if you're imaging it, you can see those stars. And as the name suggests, there are, are four main stars, but there are actually a lot more which are, are fainter. So it's quite interesting to see how many you can see in there. Um, but that defines it very well. And that bright sort of kidney-shaped area yes. around it, yeah. that's, that's called the thrust. And then you've got... Because lots of these, lots of parts of the nebula have lots of different names. They do. There's the, fish the, fish's, the fish's mouth. Yes, yeah, so, so all these different... What's interesting is even with an 8-inch telescope from a, you know, a, a, a town centre, you they have just how much detail you can pick up. Yes, you can. It is yeah. quite remarkable. It's a stunning object. And the one next to it, which is M43, which is comma-shaped. Yes. Um, <laughs> with the very confusingly named... NU Orionis, because it looks like New Orionis, but it's not. It's NU, which is a variable star. Yes. New, New Orionis <laughs> is a different star. Um, but it, that sits right in the middle of it. But it's definitely comma shaped. It is quite difficult to see because I think the Orion Nebula just burns it out completely. Yeah, I, it, it is somewhat overlooked, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so that's a great thing to look out for. There's loads of stuff in there, loads of other clusters, etc., etc. So, um, yeah, just have a look at that with binoculars or a telescope and just take in the detail, take your time with it. Now, there's another um, very nice um, nebula which glows away, which actually, I think the Orion Nebula steals the limelight from this one because it is a beautiful one to look for. So basically what you have to do, you've got the straight line of Orion's belt and imagine that line and then rotate it around the eastern star by 90 degrees in an anti-clockwise manner. <laughs> Sounds complicated, it's actually quite easy to do. Um, so where the, the free end would end up, that points exactly to M78. And M78 is a beautiful, um, it, it's sort of, a, I think it's a reflection nebula, it's sort of whitey, misty, very complicated area around there. And there are two brightish stars in the nebula. And that always reminds me of um, a car coming at you through fog with its lights <laughs> on. Um, so that's worth looking out for. Yes, yeah, so I've never seen that. Um, immediately east of Alnatak is another bright nebula, um, also rather overshadowed by the brightness of the star. But this is NGC 2024, the flame nebula. Oh, yes. This has these dark lanes running through it. So I'm told it's not too dissimilar from a leaf. I've never actually seen it with a naked it's eye. It's quite distinctive, actually, um, but it is completely overpowered by Ulnitak. It's just, um, 
it's a it's a very bright star to be near this. It's a bright nebula though, um, and the, these dark lanes they they do create the sort of like veins in a leaf, or right. um, it gives it. It does look like a bit like a flame going up, um, but there is. Um, it's an interesting place to start from because if you go below that to the south of that, there is a, a long um, curtain of glowing nebulosity. Now this is pretty faint, um, so it suits big telescope or long exposure astrophotography. Now there is, I was almost fascinated by this as a boy because you saw photographs of it and on one side of it there aren't very many stars and on the other side of it there are lots of stars. Yeah. So that suggests that the dark bit is a dust cloud. Where, the, where there isn't much in the way of stars is a big dust cloud yeah. or a, a gas cloud. And in fact, there's a finger of nebulosity that pokes in front of the curtain of glowing hydrogen. And that finger is very famous. That's B33, the yes. horse head nebula, because it looks exactly like the silhouetted profile of a chess piece that the, the, um, the knight. The knight. The horsey one. The horsey one you were going to say. <laughs> I away. forgot what it was called there, but yes, yes that's yeah. the one. And and it really is quite striking. But it it used to be um, it used to be a rite of passage to take a photograph of the horse head. It was really difficult. Now it's fairly common because sensors have become so, so easy, uh, so good and sensitive to pick it up. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think I must have just in recent times seen dozens of pictures of the Horsehead Nebula. So, have you ever seen it visually? No, actually, I haven't. Um, I've never actually tried because I've always had this view that unless you've got a really dark sky and a large telescope, um, it's probably quite difficult. However, now I've recently upgraded to a 12-inch telescope, so and as uh, light pollution luster isn't too bad, I am going to give it a go. I tried with a 10-inch um, many years ago, and I could see the curtain glowing, um, but I couldn't pick out the horse head. Yeah, it was I think, just on the edge. Yeah, I, I think a 12-inch might do it, yeah. right? but uh, certainly larger telescopes uh, would, will certainly show it quite nicely. Okay. Well, Orion's Belt, as we said, is the is, is probably the most famous straight line in the entire night sky. So if you follow that line uh, northwest, you eventually arrive at the orange giant star, which is Aldebaran. Um, and that's that's quite distinctive as well. It stands out very well in the late autumn and Low winter down, sky. Yeah. If you go in the other direction, of course, you come to the brightest nighttime star of them all, Sirius, the yes. brightest star in Canis Major, the great dog. Um, so, and, and also actually, if you get to Sirius, there's another object which is often overlooked. If you go about one and a half times the length of Orion's belt below Sirius, to the south of Sirius, using binoculars, you'll discover the lovely open cluster known as Messier 41. Which I've only ever seen a couple of times. It's beauty, yeah, it actually. Is, it is very pretty. Yeah. Um, of course, with, with Sirius, um, a nice thing to do, I think you've probably done this, Pete. You've imaged the pup, but Sirius has a companion. I have imaged the pup. Um, I've used a, a cheaty way of doing it. Um, it's a very difficult thing to, to image, to image because, yeah. um, and I've seen lots of people put photographs forward of it saying they've imaged the pup when they haven't. Um, now the problem is that it's it's a magnitude plus 8.5 star, white dwarf star, and it's really close to Sirius. Yes. In fact, it, it's um, similar sort of dimensions away to the diameter of the planets. So you need to have a very high magnification system yeah. to actually pick it up. And there are lots of field stars around it, and a couple of them look like they like could be they the could pop, be. and they're not. <laughs> but the cheaty way I've used is to use a planetary um, setup and actually fit an infrared pass filter. Ah, uh, yes. Because it, it shines quite well in, in, um, in infrared, infrared, and yeah. Sirius is dimmed a bit, so it comes out really well. Like okay, that. yeah. I've never, I, 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 one of the things I keep meaning to do is, is to look for the pop. Because yeah. um, uh, again, it's quite a tough one to do. Well, it's, it's a 50-year it's a uh, orbit, orbit, yeah, and it's actually coming up to the point where it's furthest away from, from Sirius. Yeah, so it's coming further away. So now is a good time to try and grab the pup, either visually or in image it. Yes, so, definitely. Yeah. And we should mention as well, the Milky Way passes east of Canis Major, um, which is the constellation that contains Sirius, um, but it's not particularly bright or distinctive, the Milky Way. You're looking winter. in the opposite direction to the core, yes. so you're looking out through a thinner layer of the Milky Way, because we're about two thirds of the way out from the core. Yeah. Um, and there, you just don't see as many stars. So it doesn't stand out like the bright 
patches of Milky Way you see during the summer. But, no, um, but it's still nice to catch it. Uh, if you've got a particularly dark sky, you shouldn't have too much trouble in, in picking it out. OK, so um, there's obviously plenty to look at out there. And I'm actually quite excited now to go out and have a look at that region of the sky again. So fingers crossed for some clear skies. Um, thank you very much, Paul. Thanks, Pete.